Yes, sir. Please just okay. just tell me uh, when to teach. I'll do it. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, so, yes. good morning to all the dignitaries, uh, faculty members, and students. Can can you hear, people hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, good sir. morning, sir. Okay, okay fine. So today uh, I will be talking a little uh, slightly different. I will not go into more technical detail of artificial engines that most of you have been hearing probably. I would be hearing further. I would be focusing more on the impact of artificial intelligence. So let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This way? Not yet. Yeah, OK. So okay. as, as was mentioned, I was heading India's technology think tank, TIFAC in Delhi, for five years from 2013 to 2018. During this phase, we developed India's technology vision 2035, please. Uh, the Prime Minister wrote a foreword to this document as well as launched it and has directed all the ministries and Department of Government of India to follow this document with Niti Ayan being given the responsibility for coordinating this effort. Next, please. Next slide. It changed. Pali, madam. Should I share my screen? Will that be better? Sorry, impossible. Please share your screen. So I will share my screen. That will be better, probably. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, it has changed. Okay, but I think let, let me try uh, with my, you know, sharing my my desktop and then we'll see what happens. Yeah, can you see this now? Technology vision status. Yes, sir. So as I mentioned, this document was followed by 12 roadmaps in different sectors. I put education right on the top as the first one, and that's why I wanted to come back to education after uh, finishing my tenure. When we're preparing this document, we focused on trying to find an objective with which we should design India's future. And we decided not to talk about money, but talk about quality of life of Indian citizens. So there was another document called Technology Vision 2020 that was released in 1996, the time Dr. Kalam used to be our chairman. So that document talked about developing India as a country. This time we are focusing on developing quality of life of each Indian citizen. So we have focused on Indian citizen, and then we have 12 prerogatives. These prerogatives, are uh, there are certain focus targets for the country and certain broad targets for the country. And with each of these prerogatives, there is a technology table that has been assigned to each of these, which focuses on different kind of technology that are needed for that particular uh, prerogative. In this, one of the technology area is what we had called technology in imagination. These were technologies that we thought may happen, may not happen, may take long time to happen. We put that in this column, technology in imagination. What we found was very interesting was the technology is happening at a much faster rate than we expect. And technology diffusion is also very high. This also means technology obsolescence, obsolescence is also extremely high. Some of you might have remembered pagers. It came and went away. So technology is surprising us in many ways, more ways than once. Before I go into AI, I would like to just share that I started to use artificial intelligence 
sometime in late 1990s. This is one of the papers that was published in December 2000, Nuclear Fusion, uh, published by International Atomic Energy Agency, for our work on applying neural networks to, our, to uh, nuclear fusion reactors. There were four papers uh, along this line. So early stages of neural networks we were using um, about 20 years back. Right now, if I look at artificial intelligence, we can classify into four categories, starting from reactive artificial intelligence to self-aware artificial intelligence. For example, IBM's Deep Blue or Google's AlphaGo, these are purely reactive. They don't have much memory. They look at a situation and interpret it and move ahead. Then you have type two, which has limited memory. Examples are self-driving vehicles, your chatbots, your personal digital assistants. Then we have type three, which is a little bit in imagination right now. We don't have the systems, which starts to look at uh, feeling, understanding. So this is type three. And the type four is where the artificial intelligence becomes self-aware. There are a few movies that I have seen on this. Eva is one of them. Eva uh, in 2015 movie, Ex Machina. There's another movie called Her, which has come. So and another movie called TV. There is a TV series called Humans. These are artificial intelligence are self-aware, but as I just said that type one and two are already been achieved. Type three and four are yet to come. I'll be focusing more on type two, which is the, with the limited memory, like self-driving vehicles. If I look at the self-driving vehicles, all of you are familiar with this. I go to Silicon Valley uh, every year and I find that if you drive around, you'll find that the number of vehicles being tested in Silicon Valley. For example, this is a two years old news which says Apple's self-driving fleet grows to 66 vehicles in California. Now, suppose I have self-driving vehicles very commonly available, which is likely to happen very soon. It's happening, it's happening uh, without being, uh, we being aware. For example, my daughter drives a car in Silicon Valley. If you see that already has some amount of intelligence there and uh, it will warn you of any likely impact Somebody comes from left side, right side, and you can leave it in auto driving mode also for quite some time. Now, if we have self-driving vehicles, as the accidents are mostly human driven, human errors, you'll find that the chances of car accidents will reduce. This will start to impact the insurance uh, industry completely. And it will become very difficult for insurance industry because with less accidents, the chances of high paying high insurance will be very less. Similarly, as we are not only moving to self-driven vehicle, but also electric vehicles are coming in. These two together mean that electric vehicles have very less uh, moving parts. So the repair parts would, repairing business would be affected, the auto repairs business will be affected because there'll be less maintenance requirement. Another example is hotels, for example. If you look at the hotels, typically, if you're traveling, we like to stay in the hotel in the night to take rest and then go out in the morning. What would happen with the driverless vehicles is that you just can sleep in the car and the car will take you in the night to your destination and bring you back as well. So you would rather sleep in the car rather than go to a hotel or a motel. So this will mean that large number of motels and hotels would start to face problem of customers. Airlines, again, similar problem would be there because people would be happy to travel. For example, suppose I'm traveling from here to Ahmedabad, I could as well sleep in my car, uh, which will take me there. And rather than trying to go to airport, wait for a long time, uh, and uh, then uh, go there and reach late night. Like typically, if I go from here to Ahmedabad, I reach an hour midnight. So it's better that you sleep in the car, it takes you there. Energy in petroleum sector will also be affected because the electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles will make sure that the demand for gasoline would be less. Right now, of course, because of the COVID-19 situation, already uh, the energy sector is very much affected. Uh, you might have heard that crude oil prices have become negative in US. Somebody is willing to give you money if you take away the, uh, the crude oil. Similar the media and entertainment, you see that right now we are all already noticing this because of COVID-19 situation. 
where people would not be traveling to movie hall rather they would be sitting in their home or uh, sit in their vehicles they'll be watching movies and so on so the whole entertainment industry is going to be changing let me look at the other aspect of this that is the aspect of job losses because most of the time when we talk about industry uh, coming in with uh, new technologies we always talk about widespread job loss what we have noticed that any time there is a technology driven societal change it brings concern and fears so mckenzie report says that by 2030 intelligent agents and robots could replace as much as 30% of world's current human labor that means it will displace about 400 to 800 million jobs by 2030 and it would require 375 million people to switch job categories entirely that means they would be have to move to another kind of job and not be working the same kind of job in fact we have got a glimpse of this with the covid-19 coming in where a biological system has pushed technology faster all of us are right now using technology we are using this we are doing this virtual conference through technology so technology and biology is combining together and we have seen biological system has now pushed technology even faster we have got glimpse of the future as as we go along now in the past if you have seen for example industrial revolution that was taking place the steam engines and come lot of textile manufacturing was being replaced by uh, machinery and the workers textile workers were very worried about this they actually went on rampages these people were called luddites and this is a picture that is a photo from 1811 a painting actually which shows that these workers started to break the machinery in the fear of job loss but actually reality is something else it's not really job loss what happens that as the task get automated things become cheaper they become faster then more human workers are required to do the other functions which have not been automated so the as the things become cheaper and faster the market grows tremendously so during industrial revolution operating a machine was being done by human being tending to multiple machine to keep them running and so on the output started to grow explosively and that as things became cheaper more and more people could afford so just to give an example in america during 19th century the amount of coarse cloths that a single weaver could produce in an hour increased by a factor of 50 50 times more clothes could be done by a single weaver the amount of labor required fell by 98% so if i just go by normal thinking we would think that the job loss will be tremendous but in actuality what happened cheaper people to actually manage those machines and so on and to follow up the rest of the the market and other things let's look at so this was i was just talking about you know there's a fear of job loss i personally expect that actually we'll have more uh, jobs rather than less jobs we have seen in our life also as the it industry came in a picture about 20 years back y2k was one area through which actually india came into this picture so job loss i don't expect in fact we expect to have better jobs day to day life how it is going to affect us all of you are familiar with alexa google home for example in my bedroom i have google home my daughter keeps alexa and uh, my grandson who is just about 2 and 1/2 years old is very much comfortable with alexa for long time so for them the young children this is nothing new it is it is something that is part of their life we connect i connect to my uh, grandson through video conferencing so it is nothing exceptional to him he is actually very much used to from a young young as a young child so our voice interaction increased today when i have to ask for time i ask my google home what is the time i don't try to look at watch in fact i have removed my watch or or look at the mobile phone so voice interaction is going to increase more and more so voice search is also happening more instead of typing we start to do voice search so what, what it is predicted that half of the online searches will be voice based by the end of 2020 this means that we have to optimize our websites for voice based searches another thing that happened is because of globalization as well as expectation of people people expect websites and mobile apps to be running 24 hour uh, 24 by 7 the support staff cannot be there it also uh, because of globalization which does not respect time zone it is very difficult to manage things so we have to use artificial intelligence to provide a solution to the problem for example ai chatbots are being used quite a bit and slowly we are moving into voice bot video bot and holographic bot 
for example, in DYPIO website, very uh, shortly, one or two days time, we would be having a chatbot. We're already testing it and we'll be, uh, so people who are coming for admission, they can get first-hand information directly from chatbot. It will save the time for human beings to interact with them. It's also helping reducing typing. For example, when I'm typing on my mobile phone, uh, either in uh, Hindi script or in English, because of predictive features, I can save a lot of time. So many times I avoid typing in a laptop, but I use mobile phone to type because it saves me you know, a lot of uh, effort. Of course, sometimes you land up in uh, funny situations where you might have meant to type something and actually something else went. And sometimes it can become serious. In fact, our chairman had told me once when he wanted to send to minister some message and the, the word got changed completely uh, and made it uh, you know, very uh, um, offensive. So you had to apologize. Similarly, you might have seen that Gmail, LinkedIn today, when you are typing message or sending emails, it's only suggesting what you're going to type. And not only it also corrects many of the mistakes. So reduced errors are there because AI does not have emotions. It is not having mood swings. It is not angry with the boss or it is not tired. So these human errors are much less. In fact, uh, one could say that to R is human and to not R is AI. Now, AI combined with robots. So when I'm talking of AI, actually AI, we typically think of the software, the algorithm part of it, but actually the sensors, the actuators, the communications, all of these combined together to make an AI system as a whole. So for example, this robot can help you in the home in this COVID-19 situation where all of us were locked into our houses. This would have been great help if somebody had released this before. Similarly, look at vertical farming, where you have multi-layer farming, where you can produce crop 40 to 300 times more crop in the same area. This has large number of sensors backed by AI, which controls every part of it and makes sure that you produce a crop which is fresh. It can come to your home in two hours and actually you can grow this very close to the consumption center. And uh, you, you use 90% less water, you use no pesticides and so on and so forth. So this is already starting to happen. And actually, you'd be surprised to know that, for example, India, the person who has set it up is not a farmer, not an agriculture expert, but an IT expert. I've been working on a project to create digital avatar, which means that we could actually transfer our personality, our brain into a digital avatar, and we could live digitally, become digitally immortal. For example, our Chancellor, our president of the university, Dr. D.Y. Patil, we are trying to create his avatar and also of Dr. Kalam. Uh, so basically, there are four types of this avatar, A, B, C, and D. I'm working on avatar C actually, but it can be converted to avatar D also. The other area where artificial intelligence is being used and will be used is areas where dangerous tasks have to be done where it's not safe to do, or remote tasks, for example, where human beings cannot reach. But they need to be carried out because of the importance of their results. Now, these are being carried out by robots backed by artificial intelligence, for example, to explore space and so on. So some robots can even fly a space shuttle on their own. For example, today, if you fly, do intertake international flight, you'll find that most of the time, the pilots are doing nothing. They're sitting uh, uh, by themselves and the flight plane is flying by itself. I was personally involved with India's moon mission, Chandrayaan 2, where I was designing a system which would be actually exploring the lunar surface after landing on the moon. Unfortunately, Chandrayaan 2 had a problem at the last stage. But on the rover, the system would have been sitting, as you are seeing here, and this would have been exploring everything on the moon. I'm not going to go into details, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that if it collects data and sends it to Earth to analyze and then move. It used to take 40 minutes to take send one picture from Moon to Earth. And that means we were told that in 24 hours, the rover can only move 10 meters. In 24 hours, the rover can only move 10 meters. That becomes a big limitation. So we were working on trying to see if we can actually capture the video there and analyze the video there itself so that it can move much faster, it can do much more work, otherwise it will not be able to do much work. So as we go to space, to moon, Mars, and so on, 
it is very important that AI backed robots are developed so that they can be functioning in an independent way and doing their tasks much more efficiently. So one of the things that is happening, the growth that is happening in space exploration is that human being is likely to become multi-species, but it cannot happen unless AI backed robots are there. Just to give an example, according to a NASA report, it has been estimated that mineral wealth of uh, between the uh, Mars and Jupiter uh, is so much, there's a stride belt, is so much that it is about equivalent to $100 billion for every person. So the amount of mineral wealth between Mars and Jupiter in the stride belt is so much that I divide among all the people on the Earth, it will be $100 billion. So with so much mineral wealth, obviously people are trying to go there. For example, NASA is trying to go there. There's a space rock, this one you can see here. This is 10,000 quadrillion dollars, not 10,000 billion dollars, 10,000 quadrillion dollars. So obviously human being is going to go and explore this. And for this AI backed robotic exploration of asteroid is very important. Let me come to another area that is the medical applications. So AI backed emergence of numerous medical applications uh, are coming up. For example, our government has released an app called Arugya Setu, which is being used for tracking COVID-19 uh, uh, patients and who comes in touch with this. So actually, can you please mute your microphone? There's a noise coming from somewhere. So it asks you certain, Arugya Soti asks you certain questions. And based on that, it actually diagnoses your uh, issues and it says that whether you may have COVID-19 or not. So these apps rely on large volumes of medical data to be able to diagnose and prescribe drugs accurately. India has a huge clinical data. And I'm part of Indian, Indian Medical Association's Research Innovation Board. We have discussed it there. The problem, of course, is that how to convert this data into clean data in the right format so that everybody can use it. Right now, this data is uh, captured in different way, and many of them have errors. So this is further actually improved by making sure that when you add sensors to this, then you start to see that it even gives you more information. For example, I had some heart problem this time. I have a little device, that device connect wirelessly to my mobile phone and it can monitor my heart and give me the information. So as we connect sensors to the mobile phone and the sensors existing on the mobile phone, a lot of medical apps are backed by AI to give you health related information. Another area is the language area. So as we might have seen that artificial intelligence translations are breaking down language barriers. It's also opening up e-commerce avenues. For example, e-commerce earlier when we started, it used to be only in English. Now slowly you start to see Hindi, Marathi, Bengali, all of them, the same app is allowing you to, to use different language, which means the customer base increases and the e-commerce scope increases. Of course, some of you might have seen this movie, uh, PK, in which Amir Khan comes in and he does not know any language. And then over a period of uh, six hours, his whole sense of a lady and he is able to learn. That means brain to brain knowledge has been transferred. So as the language barrier goes away, in fact, there are devices already doing this, but there's another thread that is coming. Elon Musk recently said, he's working on Neuralink project and just about two, three weeks back, he said that we might not use language at all because the Neuralink which is sitting in the brain will allow brain to brain communication to happen and you don't need language, language becomes a luxury. So on the one side, language barrier is going away. On the other side, the need of language will go away. And actually, in fact, uh, a few years back, I predicted that we may be able to download language in our brain. And there was a gentleman who also said that you could pop a pill inside and you will learn the language. In fact, the US defense is working on this. Other interesting thing is the trust level. So today, the trust levels with the help of AI is starting to reduce because you thought that you are seeing a video or audio and you could think that's a real person. But now even if you're interacting with a person on a video conferencing, maybe he's not the real person. For example, this is an example. I cannot show the video right now. This is just a snapshot where two people were in a conference and suddenly Elon Musk shows up there. And he's looking a little surprised and he says that maybe I've come into the wrong conference. And these two uh, participants are very surprised they think that Elon Musk, such a famous person, is coming to their room. And then Elon Musk comments about the lady's hairstyle and says that's so nice. 
Next, it was all real-time deep fake artificial intelligence. So that means whether we are recording, uh, hearing a recorded sound or a video, or we are interacting real-time also, we cannot believe on that because it could all be fake back by artificial intelligence. So this is a serious concern because the trust on what we believed earlier is no longer there. Let's come to the education. All of us are enrolled, depending on the disciple. But today we are in a situation where we call it a four-year program, it's a three-year program, and people come in and go out. Some of them might have learned 100%, some of them might have learned 30%, but they go out. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to actually uh, go to a different system. And uh, where that's where artificial intelligence-based adaptive learning is coming in. We are already in, uh, experimenting with this in uh, DYPIO. Right, just two days back, uh, we had a session where we were uh, training our faculty to use some of the systems. <coughs> so this will allow large scale education of students, uh, what is called adaptive learning. It will actually treat each student as a unique person and then accordingly teach them and monitor them. Let's move ahead. <clears throat> Coming towards the end of uh, this talk, actually, as you are aware, we started a BTEC computer science engineering program last year in DYPIU, focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning. We kept a generic name, but we allowed first two years. We completely changed the first two years. Uh, and uh, we start with, for example, we start with Python in the beginning, first semester, and AI comes in. And then they can choose different tracks. For example, they could choose AI ML. This will happen for fifth semester. They don't have to choose this in the beginning. So they can come into a generic course, computer science engineering, and then choose the track like artificial and machine learning, data science, IoT, robotics, and so on. And that will happen in third and fourth year. This uh, particular uh, program was appreciated by AICT, and actually they send us a uh, congratulatory letter. And later on, they set up a committee of which I was a member to revamp the computer science and engineering curriculum. And the uh, net result was that we have a BTEC in artificial intelligence and data science, which uh, DYP COE and DYP IEMR is also launching uh, this year. Uh, and a few other tracks that we have launched, also AICT has copied that. So this was a path-breaking multi-track system that we started last year. This year, we are starting BTEC Bioengineering. Again, this has a lot of AI focus. Artificial intelligence and biological science are combining together. And there's also MBA digital business that we're launching this year that will also have analytics as part of this. So in the BTEC computer science engineering, just to uh, go through very uh, quickly, artificial and machine learning is one of the tracks. Data science is another track. So each of these tracks, actually, you have eight to nine subjects to be covered in uh, third and fourth year. Robotics and AI is there. Intelligent transport system, again, backed by AI. Uh, and the logistics, including driverless vehicles with the possibility of fiber integrated MBA in transport logistics management, Internet of Things. I used to work on Internet of Things from last uh, you know, 20 years. We used to call it sensor network. Now it has transformed into Internet of Things. Cybersecurity, extremely important. In fact, AI based systems are also threatening this uh, security domain. Then the FinTech, our finance has, is completely changing. So in this blockchain will be there. There will be financial management uh, MBA also. FinTech MBA will be there. Bioinformatics is combining bio uh, biological science and informatics. We have brought in this again. AI plays a very important role. Cloud and system administration. And there's a web and a mobile application, which will have a possibility of MDES in augmented reality, virtual reality, holography, and games. And again, all of them have AI uh, in the foundation. Another concept is Laren Bag that I will not explain to you right now, but it's very interesting for the COVID-19 situation because we have allowed the students to actually have the system uh, which they use in the lab. They can carry it with them to home and actually have a lab in the home. Similarly, BTEC Bioengineering we're starting this year with four tracks, Biochemical Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, Cell and Tissue Engineering, and Food Biotechnology. And uh, so that's the end of my talk. There's a the few references. If there's some time, we can actually uh, have some uh, question answers. Any questions? Uh, Dr. Prabhat Ranjan, sir. Uh, Prabhat Ranjan, sir, 
himself yes. is a think tank and a thought provoking lecture we have listened from last 40 minutes and i am very much thankful to you sir for the last tagline which is given to my students our students lab in a back so very very much thankful to you and uh, this artificial intelligence and science so we have the student in a globe after 4 years with all